Hey, AP Bio. So on the AP Classroom site, uh, there was that one graph question, and a lot of people were a little concerned about what it meant with those plus minus numbers. So I'm going to explain what those are. Um, those numbers are used to create error bars. What those plus minus numbers show is the standard error of the mean. Basically, that's a calculation of the standard error. Um, every single experiment, as you know, has a range of error that's acceptable. Uh, and what the error bars do is they show us what the calculated range of error is for a particular data set. So, for example, on the screen right in front of you, we have um, this main matrix and we have the three different substances here. We have phosphate, oxalate, and uric acid. And each of these has a different sensitivity sensitivity to calcium. So we can see that the phosphate has a sensitivity of 1. Uh, oxalate is 0.8 and uric acid is just a hair under 1. It looks like it's like 0.9798 or something like that. When you look at these error bars, these show the possible range of error, which means that although this is our average or our mean sensitivity, the true mean can lie somewhere between this top point and this bottom point. So when you look at all three of these, there's a spread of error. Uh, for the phosphate, it's roughly between like 0 0.75 and 1 point, it looks like 1.25. Um, and then the spread of the mean for the error is a lot smaller for the oxalate. Um, it looks like it's just hovering um, just between, uh, it looks like about 0.75 uh, and 0.85, right? And then on the end over here, this uric acid has a range that's a lot larger. Now, well, here's what's interesting with error bars. When you compare different sets of data, if the error bars overlap in their range, right? So if this range overlaps, which it does here. That means there is no significance in the difference between these. There's no statistically significant difference between the averages we have here, which means all three of these, even though there are slight differences, this is high, this is low, this is a little higher. In reality, with the range of error, there's no statistically significant difference here. Okay, so let me show you this on another slide. So the standard error or the standard deviation error bars in a graph, right? They can be used to get a sense of whether or not there is a difference. So if there is overlap, what we see right here, okay, if there's overlap, there's no statistically significant difference. So when standard deviation error bars overlap quite a bit, it means it's not statistically significant. If there's a little bit of overlap, you see how these just slightly overlap? It probably is not statistically significant, but there's still some overlap there. When there's no overlap, that means that it's highly likely that the mean of these two different data sets is not the same. Therefore, it may be significant. But of course, it's not 100% sure. That's why we have to do something like a chi-square test. But this just gives you an idea as to where the error lies in your data and if the differences between your data are significant or not. That's the main point. Is it statistically significant? Okay. So how do you make error bars? Okay, so that's what you have to do in that lab. I'm sorry, in that AP classroom question. So here's a question came off of one of the more recent AP exams. And they give you um, this table which shows the carbon fixation that's occurring by Rubisco under different temperatures. So you can see your temperatures here. Okay, we range from 25 up to 50 Celsius. Okay, it's pretty hot. Uh, and then we see the rate of carbon fixation. And this was calculated plus or minus two standard errors of the mean. That's what this means. SE with a subscript X bar. X bar means mean. So this is plus or minus two standard deviations of the mean, which means that although they got a number of 91, when they did their standard deviation, they got an error mean that showed that there's a possible range, a plausible range from anywhere from 82 to 100. Okay, and the same thing here. This is 96 plus or minus 5, which means, okay, we have a rate of 96 uh, micromoles per meter squared per second, but it really could be anywhere from 91 to as high as 101. Okay, 
Uh, the same thing holds true also for the next one. This has a range that's from 85 to as much as 101. Okay, so what the error number does here, what the standard error, error of the mean does, is it allows you to see that there's a range for your mean from a low to a high. So how do you draw it? Well, this is what it would look like. Okay, first you plot your points, as you do with any graph. And then, oops, sorry about that. And then what you do is you draw, you literally draw your lines and you look for your top number and your bottom number. So for the first value at 25, uh, 91 was our number. And we have a range of plus nine at the top of the bar to minus nine at the bottom of the bar. Okay, and we draw those in. So for the next one, again, this had a value of plus or minus five. So again, we drew plus five from our point and minus five from our point. And that gives you that range either way, plus or minus, okay? Once you've drawn your error bars in, you can then see where the overlap is, okay? And if you notice, these first three points, they all overlap each other. So what does that mean about the difference between them? There's no statistically significant difference, which means these first three values, right, at 25, 30, and 35 minutes are essentially the same. So there's no statistically significant difference there. When you look at 40, okay, yeah, there's some overlap. So the, the range for this could still be down here overlapping these. So even this one could be considered not statistically significant. However, when you look at this one at 45 and at 50, these do not overlap each other, okay? This number should be a little large. I just couldn't get it with the PowerPoint, kind of limited. So for the value at 45 and 50, those are statistically significant. There is a difference. So it does show us that, yes, at 45 and 50 degrees, the temperature does have a significant impact on carbon fixation. However, at temperatures from 40 degrees to 25 degrees, or from 25 to 40, depending upon the direction, there is no statistically significant difference in the effect. So essentially what scientists can state based on this is that changing the temperature between 25 and 40 degrees does not have a significant impact on the rate of carbon fixation. Temperatures above 40 degrees significantly impact the rate. Okay. Hopefully that helps. Um, let's take a look at another one. Ah, uh, yeah. <clears throat> this was on the AP test a few years ago. The effect of caffeine on memory in bees. Yep, they caffeinated bees. They gave them little mini cups of coffee. All right, huh? Sorry, terrible joke, dad joke. Been home too much with my kids. Um, and this showed the effect of the caffeine on their memory. So it looks like what they did is they gave them 0.1 uh, millimolar, yep, millimoles of caffeine. And they looked at their average probability of re revisiting a nectar source after 10 minutes, and then they looked at it again after 24 hours, right? So we had two different time periods here. We had 10 minutes after we gave them caffeine, and then 24 hours later, okay? So you can see the question here. Um, they gave you a standard error of the mean, okay? Plus or minus two SEs, right? So we see 0.72 plus or minus 0.09 for the control, and then 0.41 plus or minus 0 0.07 after 24 hours, okay? So we know that in flowering plants, pollination is the process that leads to the fertilization of an egg and the production of seeds. And some flowers attract pollinators, such as bees, using visual and chemical cues. When a bee visits a flower, in addition to transferring pollen, it can also take the nectar and use it to make honey for the colony. So nectar contains sugar, but plants also produce caffeine in the nectar. Caffeine is bitter tasting is a bitter tasting compound that can be toxic to insects at high concentrations. So to investigate the role of caffeine in nectar, a group of researchers studied the effect of 0.1 millimolar caffeine on bee behavior, and there's the result. Okay, and just looking at this, you can see that the control has a lower probability of bees revisiting the nectar source, and with the caffeine, there's a higher probability. So the question really is. Is it statistically significant or not? So what they're looking at basically is, hey, these plants that have caffeine in their nectar, does that improve the chances that they're going to get revisited again, which will help them with pollination, right? Plants are smart. Told you guys that, right? 
So if you graph this, this is what it would look like. Oh, we got all kinds of stuff here. Okay, I think these out of order. Um, this was a bar graph. Okay, so if you set this up as a bar graph, um, you can see that with the control, um, 10 minutes and 24 hours, you can see the differences. And with the caffeine treatment, okay, oh, I have a typo. Um, you can see the differences there, 10 minutes and 24 hours. And this is what's interesting. Once you put this in a graph, you look at your data, you can see that is there really a difference between 10 minutes and 24 hours for the caffeine? And the answer is no, right? So when you look at the time at 10 minutes versus the time at 24 hours, there's very little difference. There's no statistically significant difference in the return time of the bees to the flowers. However, when you look at your, when you look at your control, you can see that at 10 minutes, you had a very high chance. And as time went on, there was a significant decrease in the amount of visitation of the bees back to the flowers to revisit. So what does this mean? Okay. This means that there is a significant difference in our controls. Okay. Between 10, 10 minutes and 24 hours. Now, what if you look at the difference in your control and your caffeine at 10 minutes? There's overlap there. Not much of a difference, right? So chances are that after 10 minutes, this, the bees are still making it back to the same flower. So may not be so much caffeine, might just be memory, plain old memory, um, or some other cue. But 24 hours later, right, we see a huge difference here. Okay, this is very low compared to here. And there's also no overlap in the error bars. So that tells us that, that there is a statistically significant difference. Okay. All right, let's take a look at this uh, a little different here. Right. I'm just going to highlight that one error bar. And this error bar shows the range of the value indicated in the bar graph. Okay. It's 0.72 plus or minus 0.09. So again, remember the true value of that mean can lie anywhere between 0.63 and 0.81, okay? And that's the purpose of the error bars, okay? So let's take a look at uh, this one here. Ah, so, oops, this is a good one. Uh, popped up on an AP test a couple of years back. And you can see these error bars, they're a little small, right? But when you look at these error bars, what's interesting is, this is the effect, first of all, this is the effect of different types of compounds on seed germination, okay? So here's our percentage of seed germination here on our y-axis, and on the x-axis, it's time. And what we can see is that um, this, is, this time, by the way, is hours after a forest fire. So 12 hours after a forest fire, we see a rapid jump, okay, using KAR, right, which are carokinins. Um, and by 24 hours, we see it levels off. So we see that there's no statistically significant difference here in the growth after 24 hours. But the first 12 hours, the first 12 to 23 hours, really has a major impact. Um, <clears throat> these other compounds here, when added, TMB, and which are trimethylbutanolides, and a combination of both, we can see again that germination happens later, 24 hours later. Right, we see an increase, um, and then what you notice here is it levels off, and there's no real significant difference here in these two values. So really, at 24 hours, they pop and then it levels off, and the same thing happens here: they pop and then they level off. Okay, what's interesting is that when you combine compounds, TMB plus KAR, this is what you get. So KAR seems to have a positive effect on TMB when it's mixed with it. Or you can also look at this and say, hey, when you add T TMB to the mix with KAR, you have lower percentages of germination. And this is a control that's grown without it in the middle here. Okay. What's important with this graph is that you can recognize where there really are no significant differences versus where there are in the data points. Um, and the other thing is you can see where there are impacts by combining different substances alone. KAR has a huge 
push for seed germination. You look at this, you get up to like 90, 93%, maybe even 95%. And then when you combine it with TMB, it's inhibiting it, but it also creates germination at a later time. Okay, so just a couple of things to look at with Aerobar so you kind of get the, the gist of how they work. I hope that helps. I hope that you are able to work on that last AP Bio problem because a bunch of you guys had some questions on that. And it's just been a little crazy trying to get the videos up. Um, Schoology is up and down, up and down. So you just need to be patient with that. Uh, there's a lot of traffic on it. But this is going to get uploaded and um, should be able to rock and roll. Okay. So um, any questions, please send a remind message and we will 